There's a train wreck coming in the cattle industry, big time. Cattle industry is controlled by four multinational corporations. That's what we're up against. Yeah. And what we've done the last 50 years is not sustainable. Yeah. This is not Amazon. This is not Whole Foods. This is not shopping online. This is about personal development through relationships. What does that actually do for like the small American rancher? How does that it's affect not a business? Them? We used to feed our families. We used to feed our communities. We used to feed our nation. We've lost that. We're feeding everybody around the world to the highest bidders. By saying that, we've surrendered over control to our food systems. What happens whenever you lose basically control of your food systems as a nation? Well, you lose your nation. Texas Slim. Hello, sir. What's happening? This is like a reunion. It is. <laughs> all is. We've all grown up. Our first podcast guest ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you it's were you it. were episode one. Yeah, you I were was. number one. Yes, I think. And when was that? So, because I don't know what year it is. March first, twenty twenty two. Really? Yeah. Yes. So two years. Damn two man. years. Yeah. yeah. Almost on the dot. Wow, isn't that a trip? Yeah. I I think this is episode number three for you. So we had we obviously had you on episode number one. Right. We had you on right before the Beef Initiative Crawford Conference, I believe. Mm -hmm. And now we've been on a long hiatus, but we're back now. Yeah, we're back. Yeah, uh, uh, y'all been in many places, nooks and crannies, and people's minds and everything. And I've been around the world. Yeah, and one and a half times, just not once, but yeah. <laughs> one and a half times. But yeah, it's been a journey. Uh, we've come a long ways, and uh, it's good to have these reunions back into my old hometown. <laughs> Definitely. And for someone that hasn't met you before, I would recommend going back and listening to episode number one. We did it. We did a. We did it right over Zoom, but I think it was very fitting for you to come on episode number one because it was you and Harry that connected connected originally back yeah. in 2021. I think I, we always love to give our listeners a little backstory of how we got to meet the guests. So, right. Harry, maybe you start how you yeah. met Slim and some of the content and the writing you were doing for him, and then we'll dig into it. Well, I remember coming across your piece, Harvest of Deception. I think it was the summer before I even reached out and moved down to Austin, but mm -hmm. found that piece. I was down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and was just trying to figure out how to make an impact in the food system. Came across the, your piece on Twitter. Was very interested in kind of what you had to say around big food, big ag, and how you know, our food system was being manipulated by these big players. Yeah. And, um, got down here and was looking to figure out how I could start to like build out a little bit of a, an, a writing mm -hmm. habit. And then, you know, kind of like understand kind of what you would, you would put out there, you know, do a little bit more research for myself and start putting some content out there in regards to what's happening in the food system. So I remember reaching out to you, you had posted something. You're like, I'm looking for some writers. And I was like, yeah. well, let's see what I can do. And you were, you were all about it. And um, I remember just contributing few, for a few weeks, at least, some some newsletter articles, some blog posts. <laughs> and from there, we were we were buddies, and we started going to uh, some of your micro summit events mm -hmm. and participating in those, which were awesome. Just great ways to meet some of these ranchers that we've yeah. grown to become very good friends with, like the the Warrens and the Jason Ricks of the world yeah. and the Charles Mayfields of the world, and getting to know <laughs> the Brooke just Millers like of the world. yeah, the yeah, Brooke Millers yeah. of the world, like this this great community of people that have just naturally gravitated towards your message. Um, so we're, we're uh, incredibly grateful to have gotten connected with you and all the people that you've gotten us close with. Will Harris, too. I mean, we wouldn't yeah. have that in ha that will. relationship. Girl so mm -hmm. we are forever indebted uh, to Texas Slim. So. Well, it's been a hell of a journey. Yeah. But yeah, I remember that first phone call. I remember where I was sitting whenever I talked to you on the phone for the first <laughs> time. I have, a, I have a mind like that. But... What's cool about that is that, you know, there was a lot of uh, beginnings uh, with you guys and with, you know, the Beef Initiative, everything that we were doing. And, you know, always you know, from the day one, our ethos is, you know, this is open source and crowdsourced. Yep. You know, this is a collaboration. And I could tell that you, know, you had a lot of uh, desire into you to really bring some truths. And so I think we spoke for about an hour that yeah. first time. Yep. And then, you know, absolutely nobody read your first article. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's how it always goes. Yeah. Right. right? And, and it is. It's I'm always like, Slim. Did anyone read this? You're like, uh, no, nah, maybe a few probably people. Probably not. <laughs> no. Nah. But I yeah. told you, I said, don't look at the numbers. Yeah. That's not what it's about. It's about getting people that identify and who have ears to hear and eyes to see and, you know, quality. What's yeah. the content? Is it quality? 
it always happens that way. And don't chase numbers, chase quality, mm. integrity, character, you know, everything. Yeah. So, well, I think one of the things I remember I was sitting in a Starbucks mm -hmm. parking lot, go, we were talking through the first blog post that I had done for you. And I remember one thing you said, and I think this is actually probably something that we've hung our hat on multiple times, just coming back to this message of pretend like you're in the end zone yeah. before, <laughs> before and, you get there, before you get there. And, yeah. and that was just like some guidance that I think Brett and I both needed to hear in order to mm -hmm. go from this embryonic state of like literally not knowing what we wanted to do, but we wanted to contribute to the message that sure. you and others were putting out there. And so it was like, you know, just, just this feeling of like, Hey, you guys can actually do this. Just like, you yeah. know, make, make yourselves the, the source of credibility by, presenting yourself in that way you I bet you know it's you know my father taught me that very young and i think that quote came from you know it was either daryl rule i'll say it's daryl rule because university of texas you know <laughs> yeah. horns, here we go but uh you know it's it's a form of manifestation kind of you know believing in yourself because you don't always have that confidence that you need mm. as far as presentation you might know everything that you're saying but you might not feel it basically in a presentable way, yep. you know, and that's hard to do in today's society, you know, to actually, you know, come with authority, but with humility. Yeah. yeah. And so if you can put your mindset there first, kind of live it out a little bit, then you usually create that mental, you know, uh, roadmap. Mm. And I think that's what you guys did. And I remember you guys did respond to that pretty well. I mm. said, Just act like you're already in the end zone. Yeah. Definitely. And, f you know, f screw everything else. Yeah. You know, you're going to get there. So. Yeah, and it was it was one of those things where I think once we started putting content out, we we just really felt like this was our God given purpose. And I think a lot about I think I can very vividly remember. I have a similar memory to you. I remember reading the Harvest of Deception for the first time, which was a piece that you wrote close to four years ago. Mm -hmm. And just I think I just had that epiphany moment of like just thinking about the way that the beef industry and the food system truly is broken. Yeah. And we're just feeling very fortunate that we're people like you that are really willing to be the voice of the American rancher and be willing to speak up and say the things that need to be said. Once you have those light bulb moments of what's actually going on behind the scenes with the beef packers and the commoditization, right. you, you can't unsee it. And you basically have to say to yourself, like, if I don't choose to do something, who else is going to do something? And so that's yeah. how we view you as really being the voice and the spokesperson for the American rancher, even though you're way more than that, it's like we feel like no. you're the person that's given the American rancher a voice that they desperately need in 2024. Well, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And that's that's uh, I have a lot of respect for those words and actions. And, you know, I grew up in the belly of the beast of the commodity, you know, cattle industry, mm -hmm. you know, Canyon, Texas. And that's, you know, 30 miles right away from, you know, Hereford, Texas. You bring up Packers, you know, we can go right into it. You know, uh, our industry, cattle industry is controlled by four multinational corporations. And, and you guys now know that. Mm -hmm. You've uh, talked about it many times now. And that was a progression that happened during my lifetime. So I've seen every phase of that. And I know where we came from. I know where we are and I know where we're going. Yeah. And by having that type of ingrained you know, basically all my phrase, I like to say the source of the seed of the issue. Well, we got the source of the seed of the solution. And that's what I knew that we had to do coming from where I came from, commodity cowboy country. Mm. And, you know, what we've done the last 50 years is not sustainable Yeah, in the cattle industry. That's what we're up against. Yeah, And nobody's going to admit that first until basically they run out of gas. Mm. And they're not planning on running out of gas anytime soon. But what we're going to try to do is we've got a better business model, you know, and we can go out there and attack, 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 right? Saying they're nefarious and everything that they've done. And they they should, you know, and we'll talk about this. JBS should have the Department of Justice all over their ass. I'll be the first one to say that. Mm -hmm. Our government's not going to be the savior here. And the associations which do a lot for the cattle industry, they're not the saviors. Mm -hmm. The saviors are the, the guys like me, the guys like you, and the people that are listening to this. And this is what we, it's a very gradual grassroots approach. Mm -hmm. Very few people have the grit and the, basically the, the know-how to do what we've done. And, but it's come at a time where I think the world is waking up now. Yeah, especially in the United States. Yeah. I've been around the world. I see what's going on from a macro level. 
And so everything that I wrote in the Harvest of Deception, you know, I went out there. I didn't just trust, you know, that it was uh, basically an idea that this was happening. It's it's verified. Mm. We have a train wreck coming. Uh, you know, food supplies are changing. There's a global industrial food shift going on right now. And it's been going on longer than most of the general public understands. Mm. Most of our producers don't understand. They don't have time to do the type of research and analysis that I can bring to the table. And so with everything that we all kind of joined together through the harvest of deception, it's been about three years, we'll just guesstimate. But, you know, everything that we've written about is pretty much transpired. So where are we today? Well, you guys went off and you created a good foundation of who you are, your why, what, and how. And the Beef Initiative did the same. Mm. And so that's what we're here to talk about. Mm. So, and it's it's a lot of clarity, but I like to talk now these days on what we're about to do next yeah. because we've got proof of work. We've got, well, it's not guesswork right now. And this is why it's exciting for me. All you know, I I was siloed myself off back in October, so this is the first podcast I've done in that many months. Yeah, we feel honored to be able to to be the first podcast. And for anyone that doesn't know the work that you've been doing, and we're going to get into it. I mean, you really have been on a three year rite of passage where mm -hmm. it's not just talking about ranching or what we need to do for ranchers. It's like you and the team have literally been putting your hands in the dirt, traveling thousands and thousands of miles to really learn about what the hell is going on, but then also figuring out tactical solutions of what can we do about it to really fix the beef industry and build an entirely new model, which we're going to get into. But sure. Slim, one of the things I wanted to ask you, so you know, you're a tech guy, that, that's your background, you were in yep. the startup space in Austin. Did you kind of have a light bulb moment of thinking to yourself, damn, the food system really is broken. The beef industry is I broken did. and I need to do something about it. Yeah. And I was thinking about that this morning, you know, because I always kind of like to, you know, try to storyboard a little bit about what I want to talk about. But the light bulb moment for me came, you know, a lot of people that come into your space and they come into my space is through suffering, you know, health, uh, financial something has gone on in their lives where they take a pause and they go, oh, shit, wow, I didn't realize this. Mm. And it's a good thing. Those are usually the people, I think it was Joe Rogan who said that, you know, some of the most fascinating, you know, intelligent people that he has come across in his life are people that have gone through some massive suffering and overcome that suffering. Yep. So a lot of people don't know me. I mean, <laughs> I was... I was like, have y'all ever been kicked by a freaking horse? I had Luckily, not, no. but uh, yeah, my sister grew up riding horses and she has. Right. Not fun. <laughs> well, I've been thrown up a barn, uh, up against the barn a couple of times. Yeah. And I kind of <laughs> laugh about it, but I was in a shop and, you know, just real quick, you know, I came through to the beef initiative through suffering and I, I'm a metal smith. I've been doing metal uh, for a long time, most of my life. And it's how I was raised. But I got the shit knocked out of by, by a piece of springy metal, mm. and it threw me up against a damn wall like you would being kicked by a horse. Broke some ribs, did all kinds of stuff, and what happened is I, I damn near died through a, a portal vein that had collapsed whenever I got you know that blunt force to me. And so whenever I was basically, they drained 29 liters of fluid out of my system, uh, nobody could figure out what was going on because I didn't complain about it. I just went on with my broken ribs and say, hey, I just broke my ribs. About six weeks later is whenever everything started happening. But whenever I knew, I, I, they thought I was going to die. And they said, you got about six weeks. We, you know, you, I weighed about 120 pounds, believe it or not. I got pictures, man. I look like a Holocaust. You know, it was starvation. My body was starving. And so I went through a form of starvation that was forced upon me, mm. right? And whenever I got clear and I knew that I wasn't going to die and I looked and I started using my research analysis skills set from, you know, being in Austin for my professional career. And, you know, there was a time that I looked and when I was doing the research and it was before I went on harvest and embedded myself in a harvest company and I was sitting there and I was compiling, you know, what had happened in my lifetime with the food systems, with commodity, with where I was raised uh, with the health of my family, with my immediate family, my cousins, my metabolical family that should be the same as far as health. I looked at my family as I'm sick, 
my cousins, my aunts, and my uncles. We all have the same uh, biomes. We all have the same genetics, all this stuff. And everybody basically is sick. Mm. And I was sick in a different way. And I knew that something was up with our metabolical health in the United States. And I remember the clarity. And then I, I started doing, you know, different cross-reference searches, you know, SQL calls, you know, using Python, doing a lot of different things a lot of people don't know how to do. But what I found out is that there was a big correlation to our money system, our basically commodity food system, our health of as a nation, and basically what they've done in the digital world. Mm. And so that's when I went, yep, we're, we're coming up on a train wreck. Yeah. Because, there, you know, I found out, you know, the mass consolidations of food industries back in 2016, 17, 18, same time it was mass consolidation on chemical and grain, Monsanto, Bear, all that stuff played out. So this stuff has been, they had their marching orders uh, back there in 2017. And here we are in 2024, and they got a head start on us. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, what compelled you to write that first piece? Like, what took you from somebody who's seeing all this stuff happen, this yeah. metabolic crisis happening within your family, to actually want to start being like, hey, this isn't going to fly? You know, one thing that I did, and, you know, the beef initiative was not my plan. I was, uh, I was training to go do uh, deep water diving. No shit. That's what I was going to get into next. I didn't know that. Yeah. No, I haven't told that many people. I was doing breath, di- you know, mm. breath work. I was doing all kinds of stuff. And, <laughs> you know, the beef initiative was not my intentions. But what I did as far as your question is there's never been a script here. What I chose to do is that I made a promise to basically my son that I was going to do whatever it took for him to basically have a different future than I see coming down the path for that generation. And so I said, okay, um, honor what's in front of you and basically pioneer something. That's where I come from. Mm. I come from the Texas Panhandle. It's pioneering country. It's Camacheria. I mean, we could have a podcast just on the Texas Panhandle, the history, <laughs> cattle industry, the Comanches, the longest standing war in United States history. You know, I know everything about cattle. I know everything about the state of Texas. And what I wanted to do is just bring storytelling to something to where we could actually get people's attention. And it started with the Harvest of Deception. I just started compiling a lot of research, and then I put my own tongue to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Slim, can you pull that mic a little bit closer yeah. to? I just want to make sure that we, because this stuff is good. <laughs> we got to capture it, all this, yeah. right? <laughs> so we don't want anyone any of this to yeah. get away. <laughs> so it sounds like you, you you had this kind of intuitive sense that our metabolic health was broken, our food system is broken, our currency is broken, and I know a huge thing, a very something that's synonymous with the Beef Initiative is this concept of going out, meeting your rancher, and shaking their hand. That's where we learned it from, is from right. you. So. It, when you're starting to do more research, are you going out to ranches and farms and just kind mm -hmm. of meeting these guys to see what the hell's going on? Yeah, what happened before I, I, I was, uh, I embedded myself into a harvest company because I needed to go see and I needed to kind of, you know, see where the harvest was taken, what was going on with the commodity, you know, uh, uh, crops. You know, so much of them had changed from where I grew up doing harvest, you know, out in, you know, agriculture and ranching in the panhandle. So I really wanted to get up close and kind of see who the guys were and, you know, all of that. So as far as, you know, getting into, you know, as far as the harvest of deception, it's really, you know, I guess it's, you know, looking at what we did and how we did it, it was... Like I say, kind of rephrase your question just a little bit for me. Yeah, I, I was I was thinking about um, how everyone associates you with right. being the guy of like go out and shake sure. your rancher's hand. Sure. So what were like when you were kind of doing your research and figuring out mm -hmm. what the hell's going on? Were you kind of were you going out to ranches just to see firsthand what has actually happened with the beef yeah, industry? Yeah, that's why I kind of brain farted there. But yeah, what the reason I brain farted is because that's what I've been doing my whole life. Yeah, so it's not that's just like the last taught. couple of years. Yeah, yeah you've been doing it, it for a while. It's not a beginning yeah. or ending point to that. Yeah, right. And so when I embedded myself in a harvest company, we're here in you know the Walmart story that I tell, and you know we went out there and you get a credit card. And you got 30 guys on the crew and everybody gets to eat everything that they want. Yep. 
And so I was like, bullshit, man. We're not eating freaking pizza pockets and chicken tendies, you know, for the <laughs> next, you know, several months. And so I went out there and I found uh, 40 acres. I believe it's 40 acres outside of Mott, North Dakota. And so that was really the first, uh, and that was during COVID. And they were get, almost getting shut down, their USDA. And I found out all their pain points. And I ended that harvest a little early. And the one that really is definitive is my local producer, Justin Trammell, mm. and his father, Donnie Trammell. And the second person was uh, Cole Bolton. Yeah. And the third, kind of not physically, but that would have been uh, Jason Rick. Got it. So within several days, probably 10 days, I had a core team of guys that ball all said the same thing in different, you know, situations, different times. And every one of them, basically, <laughs> Justin thought I was, uh, he thought I was a fed. He thought I was CIA. Yeah. And Cole, he was just welcoming his all get out. He's just Cole Bolton. Yeah. The and best. then uh, of course, Jason was like, hell yeah, I'll get this crazy ass, you know, hippie punk cowboy from West Texas. <laughs> let's, let's get going. Yeah. And so that's kind of how in the beginning it played out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as far as shakers, that's what I was taught as a young boy. It's like, I'd have to go up and, you know, shake a rancher's hand and talk to him. And I'd have to look him in the eye. And I know the value of that. And I think that we really have lost that. We have the division of interpersonal communication mm. going across this world right now because of the digital apparatuses in which we carry with us at all times. Yeah. Mm. We don't know how to have conversations anymore. We don't. And, you know, www, you know, shakerranchershand.com, shakeyourranchershand.com. You know, all of those things are, uh, it, it was a lead in to, it's about, establishing and building and maintaining relationships with those in which people that live to, and die to feed you. Mm -hmm. We've lost that connection. And so how do you overcome that? You know, this is not Amazon. This is not Whole Foods. This is not shopping online. This is about personal development through relationships from people that you've never had in your life before. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are scared to do that. The first person that you need to be doing that with is somebody that's willing to feed you forever. Yeah. That's it. Mm. It's as simple as that. What, what have been, what's been the biggest realization that you've had since you started going onto these farms mm -hmm. and starting to be more intentional? Like you said, you grew up shaking your rancher's hand, but going out to Jason Rick's farm, going out to Cole Bolton's farm, like what are the things that you're, actually taking away from those conversations that people need to hear about? Like, yeah. what do most people not really understand about the well, American rancher? Well, what's the number one TV show, right, in in America? Yellowstone? Yellowstone. Yeah. Yellowstone. Okay. Well, that's a good little gangster movie. Yep. <laughs> you know, and it's fun. You know, and I grew up, there was Dallas. You know, that was the whatever movie, North 40 or whatever. What people don't understand, is, and this is hidden very well, is that we're losing uh, basically connection to our, our resources. And this has been done over the last 50 years. We have a group, we have an industry right now in the United States of America that's under attack. What I find out from each individual that you just referred to is they, they're not going to complain about it. Mm. They don't have time to complain about it. They're not going to get up here on a podcast and go, y'all, come on, would you please buy your beef from me? That's just not what's going to happen here. So what I find from them is a lot of truth and a lot of integrity. But what the general public doesn't understand is once you basically develop and create and engineer your own market access, then your life changes in a way that you can't explain. Mm. You have to go through the process. And these are the stewards. They're servant leaders, and we're not paying enough attention to them, the mm. general public. We've uh, gotten a yearning and a desire for way too much convenience here. Yeah. Food is not convenient. It shouldn't be convenient. It's based on survival. It's something that is a foundation for our nutritional, basically, core systems. And, you know, one thing that we've lost is touch with food. You guys know this. Yeah. I mean, you talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. yep. But what we also, you know, I also discover, because each one of, uh, from Justin Trammell to Cole Bolton to Jason Rick, man, they're totally different type of ranchers. Everybody's trying to generalize what ranching is. It is so freaking diverse that, man, it's a rabbit hole of discovery for the general public that I'm willing 
to bet that most people are going to really get interested in here moving forward, mm. especially where we've come with the beef initiative. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And that's why what the work that you're doing is so important to really give these guys a voice and give them the ability to connect with them. And I think, I, I think back to what you said about, um, like us really, we, we've normalized a lot of things in our food system that shouldn't be normalized at all. I think back to probably when you were a boy in Texas, you know, you had rancher, you had pre, rancher, processor, customer. It was like yeah. kind of this awesome triangle. And it's from what I've learned from you, it seems like there was really like one processor per county or per town. Yeah. And now, you know, with us growing up, I, I remember going carnivore and just picking up steaks from the grocery store in New York City and never even thought about shaking my rancher's hand that that thought process mm -hmm. didn't even exist and not even realizing that there could have been 30 to 50 touch points from that feedlot in brazil to the time that steak <laughs> hit my plate and yeah. it's like we've just kind of lost this heart and soul and connection and i think um you know that it's not carnivore versus vegan it's not grass finish versus grain finish it's really just going out and shaking your farmer or your rancher's hand and just understanding where that food comes from and if you can do that you're supporting the right system and your health is going to be in the best place it could possibly be too. Yeah. And you, you and I think I'm a generational X guy, you know, I was born in the late sixties, early seventies. So I'm kind of like Sean, Sean Baker and stuff yep. like that. But really I'm a very good spokesperson to be able to speak to the work where we came from. And a lot of people, it's very foreign to them. And I mm -hmm. have to remember that a lot. And, you know, the triangle, like you talk about, the state of Texas has 254 counties. We used to have 254 microprocessing centers. Mm. That gave a lot of diversity to be able to use that cow in ways that we do not use anymore. That's what they stole from us. This is what the general public doesn't understand, is how we took the cow and we leveraged that cow within our communities instead of across the world now. You know, where does all the tallow go from all the cows that get processed in Hereford, Texas? Nobody knows. I do. It's used for biodiesel, mm. another subsidized industry. So you have a subsidized industry, commoditized and subsidized cattle industry by the big four packers. They get to take that, ta that byproduct and then they get to leverage it into another subsidized industry. How many times are they profiteering off of that cow? Well, the profit of that cow used to be within the community itself. And the number one profit of that cow was the nutrition that it gave to, you know, everybody that was consuming that cow. So there's a lot of things that people don't understand that we truly, truly lost as far as communities, as far as small towns, as far as regional, you know, delivery of food systems. You know, we've, we've gone global, and that was in the 70s when old Eric Butts said, you know, go big or go home. It's happened in the, ca the cattle industry, too, in just different ways. And right now what we're under attack is there's a, there's a train wreck coming in the cattle industry. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand the why. Well, you know, you have countries that can't feed their, their people. We have a global industry now, global beef industry. And uh, we've, uh, you know, it's been leveraged against us now. And we don't understand how. And a lot of producers don't see it really happening like right now beeves at the auction house highest price, prices ever we'll go and talk about that here in a little bit mm -hmm. but a lot has changed and so we have to get back to where we came from because history does not you know repeat but it's rhyming and you know there's been some countries already affected with this this global industrial food shift that's going on and so that's what I've been following going around the world. You know, what is really happening on the macro level? Mm -hmm. And so we have to look back at history. We have to look at now. And so, you know, we, we understand what's going on. And it, it doesn't look pretty, but I'm not a doomsday dude. This is the best opportunity in my lifetime to basically do what we're all sitting here to do, mm. what we're trying yeah. to accomplish collectively. And just for the for the listener, I mean, I, we we all talk about it a good amount, but what is actually happening? Like, if you had to mm -hmm. explain that in the simplest way possible, sure. like it's what's daunting. actually happening? Right. It's, well, you think about that. Let's just think about 254 counties. You know, state of Texas. That meant that our our beef stayed home, right? Mm -hmm. And you guys have talked about the Brazilian cattle drive. You know. The North Hemisphere in cattle is becoming the South Hemisphere. The South Hemisphere is becoming the North Hemisphere. What does that mean? You've got basically new ranches that have been built across the globe. 
And we have an old historical ranch in the United States called the Midwest of America in the state of Texas. Okay, we used to feed our families. We used to feed our communities. We used to feed our nation. We've lost that. We don't feed our nation. We don't feed our children anymore with our local beef, with our local biomes. We're feeding everybody around the world to the highest bidders. And so by saying that, we're... We've surrendered over control to our food systems. And you talked to Dr. Brooke Miller, you know, ex-past president of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. He was the first one who brought it up with me, and I agreed with him without hesitation. This is a national security issue at this Mm. point in time. Just because the TV doesn't tell you, because they're not going to tell you this, just because of the centralized media doesn't say anything about it doesn't mean it's not happening. Mm -hmm. We're under attack. Our food systems are un- under attack. I, I am now dealing with some global aggregators, and you know that's global distribution of animal proteins, of energy, and everything. Folks, we're going to have a uh, 400 million refugees over the next seven years, six years now, and this is happening. We look at Texas right now. We have eight million people that have crossed the border in three years. This is a mass migration. With that comes famine. With that comes changes of food supply lines. Mm. It changes distribution. And so we've lost distribution. Not only do we surrender over to the packers, who controls the distribution from the packers? Well, it's the same people. Mm. And so we've lost control of our distribution. You've got BRICS now, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South, of, South Africa. It's kind of an interesting little dynamic there. We'll look at the map, look at supply chain lines. And so by saying that, you know, in the United States of America, we're, our food supply is not welcome in 27, 28 countries, something like that. You guys probably know better than me. Mm. But what this means is that Americans will eat a lot. I, I say we eat dog shit because it tastes good. Yeah. And we have, we, you know, we got Taco Bell. That's dog shit, folks. And it's not a judgment, but it's dog shit. Might be worse than dog shit. And our meta, yeah, exactly. Well, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, it's just got a different label on it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's filler, right? Yes. And so, by saying that, is we will we're we're not we don't scrutinize our food systems too much. But when we do scrutinize our food systems, we're looking at the wrong things. We're Mm -hmm. looking at labeling, organic, grass fed. Those basically apparatuses have been captured too. And so how do you circumvent around that? Well, you understand the macro picture. You understand that labeling laws, FDA, you know, 2022 allowed 2,000 new chemicals to come in. Uh, It's not GMO anymore. It's bioengineered. So there's there's a war going on as far as labeling and in lobbying and legislation to hide the fact that we're surrendering over our food systems to multinational corporations that are feeding different continents. Mm. That's what's going on. At the high level, at the at the governmental level, you know, right now, you know, our beef that we eat a lot of times in supermarkets today was a, a government contract that was signed four years ago. Okay, that can't be changed. And so a lot of people don't know that either. And so you look at the global distribution of animal proteins. Why is it that Tyson is closing down eight plants in the United States for pork right now? But we're increasing our export of pork in the United States. Hmm. So we're closing off domestic, but now we're shipping in pork from Tyson. Who owns Tyson? I sh- Smithville. Interesting. Who owns Smithville? CCP, China. Okay. Our basically hog industry right now in the United States of America is controlled majority by China on a big government contract level. Think about that. So why would we be closing down hog plants? I know somebody that represented 50 hog farmers just two years ago. They got shut down overnight. Mm. 50 families, 50, you know, sets of children, and, you know, they're done. They're liquidated. The general public doesn't see that. They see the nice shiny objects in the supermarket that have all the pretty writing on them that say, you know, heart-healthy Grass-fed, yep, right. organic, holistic, this, it never ends. Mm. Those days are over with. Yeah, there might be right. It might be organic. It might be grass-fed. It's a crapshoot. Mm. There's a lot of people out there like the Warrens. They do everything they can to do organic. 
There's a lot of great people with integrity that stand by what organic is, but there's twice as many people out there that do the opposite. Yeah. They circumvent around it and they get away with it. Mm. When 85% of all meat in the grocery store is controlled by four companies, what does that actually do for like the small American rancher? How does that Puts affect them? Puts them out of them? business. Puts them out of business. Right now I'm telling everybody, and let's, 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 let's back up so people can understand kind of how I operate. I want everybody to understand where I'm speaking of is not judgment. And a lot of people take things personal these days. A lot of people out there suffering. A lot of people don't know how. A lot of people are overweight. A lot of people are having metabolic issues. This is not a judgment to them. We all got here together as a nation. So just know I, I, I report everything from me witnessing, and as Jason Rick says, observational science. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. So anything I say is not a personal attack. So don't internalize this, people out there. Don't internalize what I say. But as far as, you know, Whenever you now know and you go to the supermarket and we, we can't generalize, we have people that live in big cities. We have people who live out far out in the country. We have the inner city. We have suburbs. We have so many different types of demographics, logistics. So let's talk about a generalization. Whenever you go to the supermarket right now, you're putting a nail in the coffin to the independent rancher producer in the United States of America. Mm. Simple as that. It's as simple as that. And if you if you ignore that, you're going to be able to look back in a couple of years. We've lost 40 percent of our ranch lands in the United States. That's never coming back. That's never coming back. What happens whenever you lose basically control of your food systems as a nation? Well, you lose your nation. Mm-hmm. It's as simple. It, 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 that's what's happening. And so our health reflects it. Um, uh, basically what's going on as far as cattle right now during COVID JBS was able to manipulate the retail side of things at the supermarket for a tune of a uh, half a billion dollars in profit. What did the administration do? They find them 56 million. They'll do that every day till the cows come home. Mm-hmm. And so what we have to get people to understand, you ask the question is what happens whenever 85% of our animal proteins are controlled by multinational corporations? Well, we basically defeat ourselves. We basically help them. Our consumer demand is now supporting the multinational system that is now bankrupting the independent rancher and producers across America. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. That is definitive. It's not like scare tax. That is happening right now. I know of four producer ranchers in the United States of America that just sold all of their herds because they're getting basically highest prices ever at the auction houses. They're not coming back. Their children aren't taking over. They liquidated out. That's part of a consolidation and centralization that happened in the hog industry. And now the same people that went after the hog industry, which is Tyson, are now going after our cattle industry. Hmm. And so in 18 months, within 18 months, you know, you're going to see that, that attempt at centralization and consolidation of our cattle supplies. Hmm. And right now we're at the lowest inventories we've ever had in the United States of America as far as our cattle. That's pretty scary. Used to, we, we, we go through these cycles, right? You go through consolidations and you'll have a, you know, you'll have a collapse of the, of the wholesale cattle industry. And mm-hmm. they're like, all right, we just build our herds. Well, it's like petroleum. We have our reserves, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have reserves anymore. How long does it take to build a herd? It takes two years. Okay, what happens in two years? Well, we flood the market with what? I call it the summer of pork is coming. <laughs> and where's that pork coming from? China. China. Yeah. Where's our pork going? It's going to, I don't know, the highest bidder on the global market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're not selling our beef to the right people. We're not selling our animal protein to the right people. But we've lost control of that mm. and within the global distribution model. With these aggregators, you know, if I if I could right now, I could fill fifty containers of animal protein and ship them across seas, and I could make money off of that. Mm. But we ain't got it. Mm. Nobody's got it. There's a big bidding war going right now on food supply systems, and you look at money, you look at inflation. This is an election year. You know, there's not going to be any changes to any laws anytime soon. Things are going to happen over the next 18 months uh, that this is going to be a, a monumental shift that happened. Same thing that happened in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like there's a war on two fronts. The one war is just 
nutritional policy and guidelines in right. general in the U.S. where 63% of all calories are coming in the form of ultra-processed foods. Right. And understanding that the antidote to that is eating more red meat and animal products, but then the second part of the war is actually the fact that now we're just basically losing our farmland overseas, which I think no, I think more people are starting to come away to the fact that what we're taught about nutrition is absolutely incorrect and animal products are healthy, right. but I don't think people realize the fact that we're actually using losing our farmland overseas. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these these ranches and farms are becoming, you know, playgrounds for billionaires or, you know, Bill Gates. You know, we all talk about that. That yeah. always catches people's eyes. Well, China's done the same thing. They bought up as much uh, land as, you know, as Bill Gates has. And but one thing that right now that we have to understand, this is this is. Uh, they had the capability of doing this because we lost access to our processing centers. Mm -hmm. Everything begins and ends at the processing center. And that's what the beef initiative has basically been able to steward forward with. And now we do have USDA processing centers. We have state level processing centers. We now have the beef initiative association council, and that's basically processing centers. We've been building an, a, a consulting agency for three years now to where we're basically going to start building out processing centers across the United States. And, wow. and you haven't, you weren't able to do that before because of a lot of reasons. One reason is you didn't have the intelligence. You didn't have the basically from, from the inspections to the regulatory capture, because if you have a micro processing center and you have one of these big multinational processing centers, you got 5,000 head a day, or you might have five head a day, right? Mm. That's different, you know? Yeah. So our rules and our laws don't match up. Yeah. But the inspectors, they have to inspect this one. They have to inspect this one. They don't know how to inspect this one. And so we figured that out pretty early. And the state of Texas is really good to be able to, you know, kind of lead forward with this new consulting and this new intelligence because – we have precedents now. We have precedents as far as EPA. We have precedents as far as, you know, uh, HACCP, you know, wastewater, sanitation, everything that's required to open a processing center. It was always fragmented and compartmentalized. Well, we put all of that into a box now that people now can come to us and they want to open up a processing center in their community, a microprocessing center. They come to the beef initiative, tbiac.org is what it is. They come there. We take them from basically breaking ground all the way into your last inspection. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. See. And we have proof. It's not hopium. We're doing this in real time. We're uh, basically consulting people right now. I say we have uh, three people that break ground this year mm. on micro processing centers, but also I need to bring up, we have a lot of small processing centers in the United States of America right now in Texas that are not being utilized enough. Why is that? Well, everybody's selling their cattle at the auction houses instead mm. of taking them to basically the table. Oh, dang. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I I'm, I'm interested. To, so do you feel like we actually have an opportunity to reconnect the American consumer with the American rancher? Like, what do you think we need to do to actually redesign the food system so that that relationship can then actually start flourish, to flour yeah. flourish again? Because, yeah, I mean, that's the that's the key is like we're losing so much distance between what Brett said it before. It's like the end consumer and, and the food provider mm -hmm. so that we're not just losing you know, the nutrition and, and the, the care that goes into making high quality food, we're missing that information too. Yeah. Like, like really understanding what goes into high quality food and the personal relationships and actually having that, I think for a lot of people provides a lot of value outside of just better nutrition. Sure. And it's a really good question because it, you know, people don't, they want to do something, right? They just don't know where to start. And, and that's how I was in the very beginning. But I started with the processing center. We've got to get people because you can have the best rancher out there. Okay, this is how this is going to work. And this is how it does work. A lot of people don't see it playing out. But you can have the best regenerative rancher out there. And he doesn't have access to a processing center that he trusts and that is decentralized in a way, kind of like within the beef initiative. He can be shut down overnight. 
Mm. He's done. It doesn't matter what he does as far as inputs to the ground, to the soil, to the cow, to anything. If he doesn't have market access, clean market access through a good, really nice USDA or state level processing center, he can be shut down. Yeah. So people need to understand the processing. This is a big thing. And so to support the beef initiative, to support TBIAC, we've got a lot of investors out there, people that want to rebuild community. If you're going to rebuild community community right now, small town America and uh, or or feed inner cities, it's going to go through a microprocessing center. Simple mm-hmm. as that. Mm-hmm. And those vary in sizes. We're not going to go for the big O. You know, Cargill, JBS, Tyson, National type of processing center. Those things, we don't, that's what got us in trouble. Yeah. We're going to scale down. We're going to invert <clears throat> everything that they took uh, the power away from us. Hmm. But then you say, you say, well, I can't open up a processing center. Well, once again, it's as simple as going through the beef initiative and going, we've got hundreds of producers that are waiting for those phone calls. We have a lot of entry points. We have a lot of entry points for the producers. We have a lot of entry points for the consumers. It's up to the individual to find out what that is. Mm-hmm. You know, like go to beef, uh, beef.index, beef.support is everything that we've done for the producers. that now have them tools, digital tools, technology tools, you know, and, and basically monetary tools, you know, you know, the Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. There's so much that's coming to the plate now. And dealing with the people I'm dealing with right now, there's a lot of big money coming into this industry, not the multinational industry, the new decentralized American cattle industry that the Beef Initiative is leading right now. That's the amazing thing about what you're saying is like we're not just theorizing and no. addressing the issue of what's gone wrong with the beef industry. You, like you said, you guys have launched multiple microprocessing facilities. Yes. You're, you're like, this is all action. This is not just telling you what's wrong. It's t- it's addressing the issue and then giving you tangible solutions to pull back from the brink. Yeah. And I love what you're saying too, Slim, about how you're talking about the microprocessors. This is what it was when we had 254 processors mm-hmm. um, in the state of Texas. It's like the secret to our food system is actually learning from the past in a lot of ways too. Yeah. And I think what you and Cole did with uh, is it is it hometown? Yeah, it's hometown meat. Why don't we tell that story? Sure. Because it's a man. Because I mean, he we'll tell two stories. Love we'll tell it. Tell of Justin of Panhandle Meats and then Cole. That's a really good kind of point because I I have a lot of I I can speak to that because it's real time. Yeah, like I said before the podcast, as we were sitting here, five cows just got processed, man. <laughs> as we were speaking, okay, they had one bad day in their whole life. Animal welfare we got it covered through these processing centers. Mm. Truly, stewardship of where that beef go- now goes through a processing center. Yeah, through you know Panhandle Meats and Hometown Meats. Panhandle Meats is state certified. That's uh, Justin Trammell, Trammell Cattle, and Tier Bloom. Okay, they're smaller. They're micro. Uh, they're feeding the Texas Panhandle, thirty mile radius. That's what they want. That's their business model, mm. and so. They had to go through the whole process. That was the very beginning of the beef initiative. They they weren't open yet. They did everything from the ground up on their own. There was no intelligence out there. This is a family-run organization. Justin and his father, Donnie, got there, and they drew up the blueprints themselves. Donnie, his father, comes from Amarillo Livestock Yard, the auction house, one of the most famous auction houses in, in the country. Very historical, mm. you know, uh, auction house. And so they have generational, you know, intelligence on how things used to be, once again. So they borrowed from the past. They looked at the rules and the uh, laws. You know, Justin is part of the Farm and Ranch Freedom Allowance. It's a nonprofit organization that is a legal arm for our independent ranchers and producers in mm. the state of Texas. That's something we're working to basically spread out across the United States. We want more regional representation. So there was a lot of tools that we had to put together to be able to get panhandle meats going. Okay. So, but within that, okay, you get your processing center going. You get new producers coming through that aren't going to Hereford, Texas. Mm. They're bringing their cattle now through panhandle meats. Well, they didn't know how to brand their beef, and so now Trammel Cattle and Panhandle Meats gives people an independent pr- producer, and now with the Beef Initiative, a way to white-label their beef, take it to market, feed the people they want, 
you're going to have access to half a cow, whole cow. There's so many different options that open up to you. It's up to the consumer or the producer to bring that creativity mm. to the table saying this is, you know, it's not a piece of cellophane, cellophane plastic and styrofoam there at Kroger's yeah. or HEB. Yeah. And so by doing that now, Panhandle Meats has a storefront in the processing center. So they're selling beef. They're bringing the cows in the back dry aging them that's another big thing that's huge at the processing centers that you don't get at the supermarket is the correct mm. aging so you get grass finished and you get grain finished you get natural but they are 100 percent natural they use no commodity based systems chemicals nothing they're clean as i always say clean processing center mm. okay he's just a smaller version of what cole bolton is doing out of hometown meats now cole bolton you know they can they can go up to you know I think he set a record a couple of weeks ago, 37 head in one day. Oh, my that's, gosh. That's amazing. 37 head in yeah, one day. Yeah, and he could if he had the right team. You know, labor right now is very hard. You know, our labor market is dead. Yeah. Nobody wants to work, and that's a skill set we've lost. As you, you brought up before, you know, what are we losing? We're losing skill sets of butchery. And so Cole has to really, you know, balance, you know, his supply and demand. But what he's also done now is he's getting many, many different producers to a, a, a clean market access through a processing center they didn't have. We have Shirt Tail Creek that's coming within mm. the Beef Initiative. Sam and his wife, they weren't uh, generational farmers and ranchers, but now Cole kind of took him, them under his wing. He's processing their grass-finished beef. And ba think about the, the processing center as being the Dow. It's the center of the universe of the cow. Yeah, That's what it is. And so if we can really kind of pop culture, the processing center, butchery, you know, everything that I'm going to bring as far as cattlemen's feast, you know, tomahawk ribeye eating contest that we're going to do, you know, everything we get to really reflect back. This is the processing center. It's what it used to be. Look at and do a Google search on an image. What is it? These guys used to represent, man. They were the ones that went and they had a half a cow hanging. Mm. What are you going to have today? You know, and you could have your tri tip. There's such a plethora amount of information and education that's just waiting to be had. Where does it start? It starts at the processing center. Okay. By doing that, we take control of distribution. Mm. We take control of the input of where the cow came from, of that affidavit that it is a clean cow, and any nefarious bullshit that's going on from people that don't know how to be a cattle man or a cattle woman. So that is, it is the center of the universe. It's the most important thing in the cattle industry right now is the processing center. Mm. Because from that processing center creates business. It mm. creates retail business. It creates wholesale business. It creates community building. It creates everything. It creates product design. It creates innovation. It creates distribution from a regional standpoint. You know, you look at Hometown Meats, it's right off of I-10 uh, I right there. You know, Houston. You know, San Antonio, El Paso. I mean, think about the how our, our, our nation is set up. Let's scale everything back to where you can either, like Justin, 30-mile radius, or Cole Bolton, state of Texas. Mm. So there's so many different, you know, possibilities. It starts with the processing center. Mm. Yeah. When I hear you talking about the processing centers, I, I see your role in it being the – emblem or like you know you like popularizing like why we need to be focusing on this mm -hmm. is that how you kind of see your role and yeah just like communicating this message but also making it so that people realize these processing centers are where the rubber meets the road with actually being able to create the market access that you talk about it's a good question it's good reflection there harry because when i first started the beef initiative i wanted to just go open up a processing center so i can't do that yet let's get some awareness and it is. I, I, early on, I had a, a, a small team of, you know, people. Only, I think Jason was on, on that team. He's the only one left. But I said, hey, Rick. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become the Jimmy Dean of beef, man. <laughs> I remember you saying that. Yeah. And people don't know what it means. That's kind of a, you know, whatever. <laughs> but Jimmy Dean created a $1.8 billion brand out of basically taking local hogs 45 miles from where I was raised, and he fed families with the best hog, best bacon, best sausage that you could find in that Texas panhandle. And look where it ended up. And, you know, he died in his 80s, but before he died, he tried to get his brand back mm -hmm. because 
Who owns Jimmy Dean? Mm. Tyson. Tyson. Who owns Tyson? Smithfield. Think about that. Think about that. So Think China that. definitely owns. Yes. China yeah. owns Jimmy, Jimmy Dean. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows this. No, nobody knows this stuff. And so screw the marketing, screw the packaging, screw, screw the labeling. I'm serious, man. If you if you can really look at that, that's all you need. That's a good story, see, because Jimmy Dean was a character. And to your point, yes, that's I'm a spokesperson now. You know, I am that person that's going to speak to this. We are consulting on how to do a processing center. It's not a good old boy club. And that's what happens mm -hmm. like in Amarillo, Texas. And, and I'll speak to the commodity guys right now. Once again, this is not a freaking competition and don't take this personal. But they've got a processing center that's been approved by the city of Amarillo. All kinds of tax breaks, all kinds of stuff. And it says it's producer owned and led. No, it's not. You can buy into it. And I guarantee you what happens with these big old multi-million dollar, $200 million processing centers, who ends up owning them in the end? Be it five down, yeah. you know, five years, two years, 10 years down the, the road, who owns them? Big four. Yep. Who owns all of IPP? That was a big turning point in processing. Iowa B Packers. He did it kind of right. He regionalized uh, packing back in the day. Who owns IBP? Tyson. I mean, they're, they're, that's all I have to say. Yeah. You know, let's not get an analysis paralysis that we mm. seem to do now in the United States. We get kind of academic with everything instead of just accepting. Yeah, this is kind of fucked up. Except that there's a problem. Don't try to figure it out more. That's our job. Yeah. Go out there and basically take our recommendations. Find your entry point of solution within your own family, with your own community, with your own self first. And then you find out everything. Basically, you do see the clarity of it all. Yes. You know, speaking about China, because this is not once again, I'm not a conspiracy guy. This is just factual stuff that nobody has access to. Yes. And it could be easy for the uninforming consumer to listen to what you're saying and be like, oh, Slim is just a doomer. And what we say is you're the opposite of a doomer. You're one of the most optimistic people we know. You're just addressing the landscape of what the hell is going on with the beef industry. That way we can build a different and better system, which 100%. is exactly what you're doing. So to Harry's point, you're part, spoke per, spark, part spokesperson, but you're way more than that because you guys are actually consulting and building these microprocessing facilities. Yes. Um, and I remember... I remember when we met Cole for the first time at Cooper's Barbecue in 2022, right. they were talking about the concept of doing this processor. Yeah. And then like a year later, you guys had the freaking thing built. I'm like, this is insane. Like you're literally disrupting the beef industry by doing this. So how long did it take from start to finish to get home to home? Is it hometown meats? Yeah. Hometown meats. How, how long did Too it take? Long. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Cause he was up against COVID. I mean, you know, but still he, quick him and Clyde, yeah. you know, Clyde summer Lottie of two bar C ranch. That's where we had the big uh, cattleman's feast down there in Luling. And that's been already over a year and a half ago. I think it's been too long ago, but Clyde and Cole went into partnership and, you know, Cole, Partly started his herd with Clyde. He does, you know, um, bulls, Angus, everything. Anyways, he's a great outfit, both great outfits. So they they had really kind of laid down the the blueprints of everything, and they were acquired some of the equipment, everything before COVID, and all this hyperinflation happened. But because of COVID and everything, they got a late start. So the whole you know, as far as breaking ground and then fully operational, it was a couple of years. A couple of years. Yeah, and it was too long, and Cole's the first to admit that. Same with Clyde. And they they, they ran into a lot of things that they didn't see in the beginning, mm. okay? And that's really what the delay was. It wasn't that it wasn't possible in a streamlined, efficient fashion. It's that they had to battle a lot of economic bullshit, a lot of societal bullshit, and just, you know, in, in bullshit in general as far, as far as the cattle industry during those times. Mm. And so it took too long. But right now, I mean, coal is – they're hitting their stride very mm. well. They need more, though. They need more. You look, you look at a processing center, and I brought it up earlier. There's a lot of processing centers that are about to go out of business right now. Okay? This is a call to action. We've got to bring this awareness and these are smaller – I mean, I've got processing centers that I know about all across the United States, the independents and the multinationals. And we'll talk mm. about the multinationals. i got some stories. But I also get stories from these local, you know, smaller processing centers 
of of people doing it wrong and not just the multinationals but other people that are are fudging the laws and and basically manipulating um, you know regulatory capture in organic grass fed in certain ways and so that's my job is to truly I'm not a loyalist. Now I get to really stand on the fucking mountaintop and say, this is what's going on, folks. Yep. I don't give two shits. If you like me or if you hate me, you're going to remember what I say. Test me. Mm. See if I'm right. See if I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. If I'm right, thank God you listened. Mm-hmm. And so this goes to all the commodity guys out there. It goes to all the the people. Say, I'm not a doomed. I'm not like you said, man. That's all I do is you optimistic. Know, I, I have to be, man. Yeah. I've broken twenty bones. I got freaking fourteen pieces of metal in me, man. I've broken my neck. I got to be optimist. And we're still standing, <laughs> and we're still fighting. Yes. And so it sounds like with with Cole, you, you like you said, timing was tough. COVID, but you learn a ton in those those early experiences. Yeah. And I would imagine now he could probably spin up a processing facility a lot faster, potentially even cheaper too. For mm-hmm. someone, because my sense is there's probably a lot of people listening to this show that are into red meat and they care about the beef industry and maybe mm-hmm. they've made money in tech or other industries and they want some skin in the game. Yeah. For someone that maybe would want to open up a microprocessing facility, if you had to guess, how long do you think you could, how long would it take to get it up and running? And then what do you think the capital commitment would look like for something like that? So we don't generalize, you know, because yeah. we we, we kind of get trapped into doing that. And I'm going to speak to Justin's first okay. as far as Panhandle Meats. I think it's more doable and it's actually more – and Cole would tell you this. He said, I went too big. Mm. And so that was something he had to learn, though. But that was a different day and time. The cattle industry was different, you know. He didn't think that he's going to have to b- battle auction house prices that are at all time highs right now. Okay, mm. people aren't taking their cow to plate; they're taking mm. it to the auction house because they're saying it's making the same amount of profit. Mm. So that means less throughput through that processing center. So when you have a bigger processing center, you've got to have all those ha- uh, hooks. You know, they've got to be full. Yeah. And so let's talk about Justin. Whenever they started, I believe Justin put a price tag that they got into. Panhandle meats for about nine hundred thousand dollars, but this was a couple of years ago. You know, material we weren't in hyperinflation and everything. But just to generalize, to give a you know a, an entry point of thought and maybe like, hey man, we can do this. I'd say right now, uh, one point eight million for basically a, a microprocessing center where you could do about thirty beeves a week. Mm. That's 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 very you know loose. But that is something that I will put my word on that you can do mm. for sure. So 1.8 million for a processing facility that could do about 30, 30 holes of beef. Yep. It's not bad, honestly. And the only reason you wouldn't do more than that is because you'd have to add on to cooler space mm. for the aging process. That's one of the biggest things. You, it's hard to really build out as far as capacity. You just don't know. But that processing centers aren't hard, man. They're just metal buildings. Yeah. Okay. It's the, it's the flow. You know, and, you know, your equipment and, of course, the kill space. You want to do everything that is top notch, that is very humane. So that engineering takes a little bit more than it was in the past. So you're going to have a little added cost in doing it right. So that cow only has one bad day. Mm -hmm. But as far as them being complex, no. What's complex is basically getting around the regulatory capture that really handcuffs microprocessing centers from being able to be fully functional. This is what Pranhandle Meats has done is showing that, hey, we've got precedents here. They had to go through two inspections. Their last inspection, one of the head inspectors of the state of Texas, we got him on YouTube Mm -hmm. right now saying this is the standard for microprocessing center across the state and across the nation. So we know what we're doing. We have legal. We have legislation. We have basically our fingers on the pulse of all of the nefarious things that people freak out about every day as far as processing centers being you know, shut down like Amos Mill or all that mm. kind of stuff. We don't worry about that. We are processing. We don't have to worry about what they're doing out there. We know what's going on today inside the processing center with USDA and Texas and you know all the other states. And so we don't worry about anything. We're the ones that are leading. We are educating sometimes the inspectors because, like I said, they know how to inspect the big, you know, processing centers. They don't understand. 
And if you look at the yeah, everybody's against, you know, USDA, government, federal, state, all that. Most of the time, our inspectors, they're wanting to work with the community. They have the best intentions for being in that position. Mm. So let's lose everything else and let's work with what's in front of us, who's in front of us. And so it becomes a working apparatus that really does uh, pioneer into a new um, industry of processing. That's where we are. And we have full confidence. You know, like I said, we usually try to talk people out of it mm. more than we try to talk people into it. But if people can answer all the right questions, like if you go to tbiac.org right now, that's how you get a conversation with me about processing. And I'll know your intentions. If you don't hear from me, it's like you're not there yet. Yeah. And that's not a judgment. You're just not there yet. Mm. You need to feed your community and you can make money at this. But your intentions better be to basically help save the cattle industry, help save local producers, learn how to build community, learn how to restart a small town or a small community, a suburb, whatever it is. But your intentions better be lined up. Hmm. But then you go on to hometown meets, price tag around that. I would allow Cole and Clyde to kick me in the ass if I try to put a price tag on what they've achieved. But it's not saying we don't have a price tag. I know what it is, but you look at 250, do your own math, and that's what you can do. About 2 million for, you know, a micro, a regional size for hometown meets. It's, you know, do your own math. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how, it's, it's really about up to the individual what they're trying to achieve. Mm. How do you think you go about filling some of that skill gap, that education yeah. of like the workforce? being there to actually be able to run these processing facilities, like 254 mm -hmm. processing facilities in Texas, one per county. That's yeah. like a, a massive shift in how many people are actually working these facilities. So what is that component of this whole thing? This, this well, whole we, we have to, like? you know, I started the I Am Texas Slim Foundation, and that's a nonprofit. It's a 503 and it's approved by the RS. You know, we, we've raised, and this would be a good time to segue into Jason Rick. And, you know, we raised $10,000 for Jason Rick. Mm. And now we get to award Jason Rick with that grant. And, you know, he's been busy doing everything that he's doing right now. And so by saying that, the I Am Texas Slim Foundation has five pillars that we lead by. And one of them is basically to create the next generation of regenerative farmer and ranchers in the United States. It's also the education that is required. Um, Justin and Cole have talked about, and especially Justin, because he comes from uh, good internship programs and education that got him to where he is. We have to start educating the next generation of butchers, of people that are really ready for that type of skill set, these young men and women and that's who really is taking the baton right now in these processing centers. It's people that live in the local communities that find those type of skill sets very valuable that they already have or that they're, they're wanting to make a career out of it. we got to make it a career again. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have to do together. We yeah. have to bring that awareness. And if we can bring that awareness... I've, you know, Jason's going to have an educational curriculum that he's doing two different educational curriculums with that $10,000 grant. So he's going to go out there and become the educator. He's not going to rely on Colorado State to teach people about regenerative farming and ranching. It's going to go through the producers and ranchers. The education is going to go through the processing centers. Wow. Mm. And so I'm already working on building that type of trade school system to where we can award scholarships, internships, training, educational classes. It's all going to come through the pillars and the, basically the, the ethos of I Am Texas Slim Foundation. Mm. So that is going to be a very powerful nonprofit. And uh, I finally, it, the reason we held back is because IRS, it took, they were backlogged. I mean, it took almost two years to finally get that nonprofit, you know, set and ready to go. Yeah. But I finally got the final approval on January 16th, 2024. Well, so here we go. So, that's incredible. So yeah. is it, how do you actually donate to the foundation? Well, we've got a website that mm -hmm. we're uh, basically finishing out right now. Uh, if you read any of our sub stacks, all that, you, there's a donation page in there. We had the old one before I went off to Australia, and it was kind of a final kick to get Jason his $10,000 for that first grant. 
And so it's kind of old school right now, but it's still there. You can go to thebeefinitiative.com. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll talk about that. I'll give you all some links that you can put into the podcast and stuff like that. But what I, I really, I formed the foundation in a way that we're, we, we're going to go after big ass grants too, you know, cause you look at, uh, the federal government, you know, the current administration is given a billion dollars for processing centers. Guess who's on the laundry list? Will Harris read it out, I think, on Joe Rogan. Yeah. Guess who it is? JBS. Like Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> all of Walmart. Yeah. yeah. And so it's all the big dogs are getting this federal money. Well, we're going to play their same games because there's tons of people out there that want to give back that they don't know where to give. And now that we've got, you know, the nonprofit We've got this first grant that Jason really, we're going to, you guys have him on the podcast. We're going to really show the world what he's doing right there in Crawford. You know, and all, a lot of that started from that, you know, for the Beef Initiative Summit that we had in the Norfolk Valley of, you know, Crawford, Colorado. Yeah. And so we have to work together. We have to get people, you know, I tell everybody, watch the freaking Bearded bush, Butchers. Those guys are phenomenal, man. Mm. That's the type of stuff young men should be doing right now. Yeah. You know, you learn butchery skills and you have access to a processing center, man, you can open up your own butchery in a small town right now, right now, They're, without question. You're going to have hang a half a side of beef and you're going to sell it out just like Franklin's barbecue does. Yep. He sells out his brisket. He's gone. He's done for the day. Why aren't we doing that with butcheries? Yeah. We can do that. Mm. We have processing center. We don't have to ask JBS, can we have one of your beeves that, you know, you got at the auction house. We're going to go down there and talk to Cole Bolton or Justin Trammell or Slim from the Beef Initiative, and we're going to start creating and innovating. We're going to quit asking for permission. We know the laws better than the law enforcers know themselves. Mm. So it is time for innovation. Three years ago, we couldn't say that. Now mm. we can say, no, what, can. you know, I'm saying today. I love what you said too, Slim, about being willing to play the same game that a lot of these big guys are doing too. Oh, yeah. I think a lot about um, you know, the future of ranching, and I'm very inspired by a lot of these first gens that I see that want to get in the game, but it's it's the knowledge gap is one thing, and then how capital intensive the business actually is to get into ranching. And our yeah. buddy Kevin at Perennial Pastures, who I think you got connected to maybe two years ago. Yeah. I mean, he's the perfect example of he he came from the tech space. He had some autoimmune issues. He fixed it by going paleo, and he decided he was like, I want to have that skin in the game and really grow food for the community and start my own ranch and do it at scale. But it's so damn capital intensive that right. luckily he was able to raise capital. Um, the founder of this huge soap company was able to cut him a, you know, a few million dollar check, which allowed him to go buy land and expand operations. Right. But if he didn't have access to that capital, there's no way he'd be able to do what he's no. doing. So to your, your point is so important because it's not just knowledge, it's the capital piece as well. Well, and you look at capital right now, you know, commodity side system and ranching, you know, you're going to go to ag credit, you know, you're going to go through all these agricultural financing, you know, apparatuses that have been created over the last 50 years. A lot of them, they're, the banks are owned by Cargill themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and so we're like, shit. So it brings up a good point, though, capital intensive. Let's talk about the auction house prices right now. What's going on with our beeves right now at the auction house? I keep bringing it up. Okay, our cattle inventory in the United States is the lowest it's ever been. All the numbers aren't even in yet. Why is this happening? Well, everybody's selling their beef at the mm. auction houses. The wholesale auction house, who is that? That's the big four packers. Okay, their independent ranchers and producers are paying down their debt. They're selling out their herds. Can't blame them for doing that. They're being responsible. These are record prices. Take your profits when you can get them, right? That's what the bankers are telling everybody. You know, clear out your debt as much as you can. These are tough times. But what's not being basically broadcast, it, financing is drying up. Hmm. So you sell your herd, where are you going to finance that next herd? Hmm. It's not the same people that used to be in the past. Yeah. So you have a lot of new people, new players, people up, up on the 1% level, and then a little bit more down than just the 1%, but they're finding out that, hey, we're having to shift debt right now. I'm starting to see a lot of people that would not have been investing into agriculture just three to five years ago. This is the first thing we're wanting to invest in right now is agriculture. Mm. Okay. So financing is changing. The capital investment, perennial pastures got money in a way that he didn't see coming. Mm. And so you're going to start seeing that. And that's what we're going to stir through the beef initiative. Those NDAs that I've talked about that yep. I'm in right now, that's part of it. I'm talking to a lot of money people 
but they want to make sure that they're investing in something that is not on the commodity based system of profit losses. You know, what is your price per acre for a cow? You know, the, the game is changing. The equations are changing. And so we're basically doing new math right now. And so once that kind of goes forward, we're going to bring financing into the Beef Initiative Association Council as well, as far as, you know, processing centers, or once again, you want to create your own herd. Let's get into herd share programs. Because what I hate the most is, did y'all hear about Agridime? No. no. Okay, Agridime is a $200 million Ponzi scheme that <laughs> happened on the commodity side of the cattle industry. It just came out. and Everybody can do the research on this. $200 million. Okay, 2,100 investors lost it, pretty much everything. SEC's doing it right now. I know producers that basically, I know a p- producer up in the Texas Panhandle that committed suicide because of this mm. shit. A lot of people lost everything overnight. It's a Ponzi scheme in the cattle industry. It's because everybody basically financing, you know, money is changing. We're going through a monetary shift here. And it's really hitting once again. That's part of the producers being driven out of business. And so we've got to bring the new money guys into it. But we also have to look at cattle ranching differently than a commodity-based system from a regenerative-based system. Mm. And so that is a great and a wonderful opportunity right now. The people do have that capital money and look at perennial pastures. He, yeah. he hit a home run with that. So it's an amazing system. And it makes me think about, I feel like you've really threaded the needle between all these incredible people in the Bitcoin space and the Mm -hmm. ranching space. And I think back to the Crawford conference of having ranchers downloading a Bitcoin, a digital wallet and being able to accept Bitcoin for the first time. Like that's changing the game for a lot of people. And I think about all these amazing Bitcoiners that probably got into the space in like 2013, 2014 have done incredibly well. And now it's like you almost have this obligation to be able to invest in ranches or processing facilities and really put your money in the right place, too. Well, I'll tell you what right now, and, you know, I can't speak of the NDAs as far as names, but this is the type of stuff that I've been approached as far as a beef initiative, Texas Slim, the five pillars of, you know, the beef initiative, Texas Slim's Cuts, which is our basically production company, giving the voice to the American ranchers, giving the short films, all the content that we produce, everything. We're their production company, yeah. Texas Slim's Cuts. Then we have the Beef Initiative Association Council, right? And then we have the I Am Texas Slim Foundation. Okay, well, we also have some other parts of that that we're going to start talking about. But I've been, you know, what has Bill Gates been doing? What are the billionaires been doing? What did Taylor Sheridan do with the four sixes? You know, the the basically acquiring ranches has changed. Yes. Well, I've been asked to basically put together the new modern day ranch from people that have a lot of money. So let's look at a big ass ranch. It costs, let's say, two hundred million dollars. Well, that two hundred million dollars ranch is now going to be the new modern day cattle industry. And we're going to do it in ways that was not possible before. We're going to have our processing centers on the ranch. We're going to basically have our fertilizers. We're going to have our regenerative inputs. Everything's going to be done on that ranch. Mm. We're not going to be basically outsourcing anything. It's self-contained. Closed loop system. Closed loop system. That is now. We've got basically... I think uh, right now I'm actively working on three proposals for three ranches across the United States that have price tags from 80 million all the way up to 200 million. Wow. And these people are coming with money. They're bringing capital and they're coming in for all the right reasons. They want to save the ranching industry. They want to change the freaking narrative here. Mm. Instead of Bill Gates, we're going to say beef initiative. We're going to say Texas slim. We're going to say a new branded beef line. Mm. that comes out of one of these ranches and it's going to be a white label beef system that they stole from us and we're going to be self-contained self-sufficient and we're going to go out there and feed people that we want to feed we've got a new slogan right now it's called rappers to ranchers we're talking to some very prominent people in the rapping community that have money old school guys that have grants now that they're wanting to feed the inner city well, they want to learn everything about ranching. They have capital money that they can invest and go get their own damn ranch, create their own food system on that ranch, feed the inner cities. They're not going to ask Bill Gates for permission. They're not going to ask the multinationals for, pres- for permission. That's this opportunity that we're up right now. 
everybody that whenever I first started the beef initiative, they said, this is impossible. Well, bullshit. We did it and we're doing it every day. So people are going to start understanding that this is a viable option for investment to make money, to basically build community, Mm. to save children's lives, to change the health of a nation. It's all here. We have the protocols, we have the collaborations, Mm. and now we're just putting it all together. You know, Mm. that's why we're talking today. What, uh, what are the next steps? Like, how do you make it all, make it all happen? (laughs) Next steps for me basically is to continue doing what I've been doing. I've been around the world one and a half times for the last year, last two and a half years, 160, right about 160,000 miles, probably across the United States in the old pickup truck. (laughs) And so that never stops. But for me, the next steps are going to be really articulating everything. Whenever I first started out, I was shotgunning everything. It was reconnaissance, you know, what's going to stick? What's going to stick? Where's people's mentality? Does anybody really understand what I'm saying? And very few people really did. But now people are starting to really understand. And so the first thing that the individual has to do along with me is to let's, let's act like there is not a basically a food system. Let's... Let's look about like where I came from. It's, you know, the Great Plains. It's Llano Estacado. It's Camacheria. No food system exists right now. How are we going to build the new food system? Mm. And I think you guys are kind of hitting about that right now. It's like, you know, are we going to do something with the food systems, right? Yeah. That's what you guys have been looking at. Next steps, let's build the food system. Well, the food system's already been built. It's through the gates of the Beef Initiative. Mm. And that's just not about beef. We had to start with beef because beef is something that has not been centralized and consolidated yet. Yeah, It's a perfect model, especially now with the regenerative side, now that we don't have to rely on the basically the commodity input system as far as Monsanto bear, uh, we can be self-contained. We don't have to ask for permission. I mean, I'm having conversations with people in the Department of Commerce Department of Transportation. We're looking at rail lines. We're looking at everything. We Mm -hmm. have it. We have these negotiations going on right now. Mm -hmm. And we have new technology coming that are giving us the raw materials to where we are creating the regenerative inputs from fertilizer all the way into feed. It's just not about grass finished anymore, guys. It's about regenerative, 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 that closed loop system of inputs that we can give to the cow that basically is going to make our lives healthier, our communities healthier. Mm. So everything really is going through the gates of the beef initiative. So next steps, if you're a consumer, find a rancher through the beef initiative, right? That's it. Just the beef dot index, you know, beef, Done. Beef, yeah, beef dot beef initiative dot com. I mean, we've got them listed out here, you know, 200 plus on the website. Yeah, 200. And we have in that, you know, it's easy to go out there and scrape the Internet and get a database. You know, I've seen people come and go in the last three years that have done that. Well, that's bullshit. That's just scraping the Internet and creating a database. And look, I got a grass fed database. How many times has that happened? <laughs> A lot. Yeah. And we grew it with one handshake at a time. It started with three producers and now it's over 200 and we haven't even tried to, you know, advertise it. That was word of mouth. I want to get it up to a thousand. And that's once we get that thing going, this becomes a whole new algorithm. You know, you, we talk about, you know, what are the, the tools for everybody? Well, just the beef initiative.com beef dot support is tools for the independent rancher and producer to start utilizing right now. OSHI, we have the new OSHI plugin. And what that is, is a new decentralized value for value marketing and advertising affiliate link Mm. that nobody pays any money until the sell is done, until the value has been exchanged. Producers have never had this type of plugin. This is, you only pay for what you sell as far as marketing and advertising, instead of somebody like grass fed marketing, I think yeah. that's what they're called, $15,000. You think crazy. producers have got that much money? Absolutely not. No. And so what it is, it's an application layer of middleware of marketing, and it serves no purpose. I know four producers that went out of business because they gave money to grass fed marketing. Come on, man. If you're going to do it, do it. 
So what we did in the last three years is we developed, you know, with OSHI, of course, uh, Michael and JP, they developed a new plug-in system that is everything that I talked about from the very beginning that Adam Curry does so well, the value for value exchange. Well, now we've got technology that is automated that becomes basically a marketing and advertising tool that is an algorithm within itself. If we we're going to have a dashboard where we can see, let's say it's, you know, J, uh, Jason, Jason's using the plug in and we see that he's selling a lot of beef. We'll promote him. It'll be a real time algorithm of marketing and advertising through these plugins. And so if you need, you know, to get a bump in your sales, all you got to do is reach out, ping us, boom, we're going to up your marketing and advertising through the plug-in, boom. Texas Slim's Cuts is putting, you know, the advertisements out there. We're writing stories on the Substack. So we've got the we've got the algorithm down now. We've got the technology. We've got the plug-in, and it's not costing $15,000. You only pay whenever you sell your beef. Mm. That's never been done before. No. Yeah. You've basically just taken the playbook, the old playbook, ripped it up and built an entirely new playbook. Had to. Yeah. Which Absolutely. is amazing because when we met you, the, I think when we met you, there was a sense of like there was so much heart and soul behind the beef initiative and you had this huge vision with it and it was always around the concept of saving children's lives. But I think the question was always like, the vision is amazing, but it's pretty daunting to execute yeah. on this vision. And I think a lot of people the last year have been like, I know Slim is working really hard, but we haven't really seen him on social media. What's he doing? And it's right. like you've taken all these thoughts in your head yeah. and you're actually turning it into reality right now, which is so exciting. Yeah, and, and it was. You know, when I first started, and I've been asked that question, Harry, a thousand times, what do you do next? Go out there and do what you did. What did you do? You looked in the mirror. Yeah. What did you do? You looked in the mirror. What did I do? I looked in the mirror. And that's all it takes. And it's not something that is hard. People change perspective about food, for one, change perspective about what your possibilities are as far as the individual, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and quit, quit. And this is a, this is a problem across the board as far as America and humanity as a whole, we're dopamine junkies. We are. That's something that has been engineered in my lifetime. I, I was in the labs when they were doing it. <laughs> I know exactly when it happened. You know, the perfect storm of dopamine, you know, addiction. We're not developing enough serotonin, man. Mm -hmm. you got to test. You know, this is me harping and me mentoring and advising. Quit consuming 42 podcasts a week. Yeah. Get one good podcast. And this is what I learned in Thailand. I've been studying Buddhism and everything. I do a lot of philosophies. We're not testing enough. We're consuming too much. Mm. Your, auto, your, your consumption model what is your consumption model? Your audio, your video, and your food. They're correlated. And so if you can really understand what consuming is doing, and you should be producing more than you're consuming. Yes. And the individual needs to understand that whenever you're going to make a change in your food systems. Go to your pantry. Clean that shit out, man. Divorce the supermarket. Act like you're in the Texas panhandle. We're developing a new food system. It starts with the processing center can't find that find a guy that's out there find a woman out there find anybody start with butter <laughs> start with eggs start with milk you guys have talked about every one of those mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the whole package man this ain't the supermarket <laughs> reinvent yourself through food mm. reinvent yourself understand what market access means mm. lack thereof once this stuff is gone we don't get it back no market access market access what is your market access to life right now who's in the way is it you or is it somebody else you know and what does market access mean to us you know so many times especially when we're young i did it taco cabana at 2 30 in the morning man come on you know how many times have you know we do this every day of our yeah. lives though but there comes a time to where you have to really create that foundation of understanding what food is and what is your metabolical health. Why do you desire what you desire? You know, mm -hmm. we got DSM. They changed their name. It was Royal DSM. Have you all talked about them much? No. Okay. They, but they basically are the engineers of humanity's taste buds right now, and they're very proud of it. You know, we got nanoparticle technology coming our way that basically the FDA and the USDA just love. You know, our, you go to a convenience store right now. 
those every one of those flavors weren't here five years ago. No. There's so many things that happen that people are unaware of. We're, we're addicted to food at this time, at this point in time. You know, I spent a lot of time overseas. Food systems are different. People are behaving differently in different parts of the world. There's a different form of spirit. In the United States, it looks pretty dire right now. Yes. I see a lot of divisiveness. I see metabolical bankruptcy that I've never seen in my life. Mm-hmm. I'm not suffering from that. I never participated into the multinational system that much. I've never really been that much of a supermarket guy. It's because my core belief system wasn't, you know, around that. And so we have to get back to the basics. We have to get back to the source of the seed. Mm. And we have to get a form of empowerment. We have to quit saying we can't do this. There, the opportunities are there. Be it, a, be it somebody that wants to have their own farm and ranch, or how about you just make an obligation to yourself that you're going to go out there and form a lifelong relationship with somebody that wants to feed you. Mm-hmm. What an honor. Become the marketing arm of a rancher producer in the United States of America. That's easy, man. That's easy. Be proud of what you're consuming instead of not telling anybody. Our consumption model is a big old white elephant room in, in the room. Mm. It really is. How many people tell you what they consumed on their phone every day that they're really proud about it? They're not proud about it. They're usually talking a lot of fear. You know, the fear porn that gets circle jerked around, you know, with its algorithm of sharing and parroting every day. Well, why don't you do that in reverse and start doing it about the person that you met that you're helping support, that you love to send Christmas cards every year? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it is. It's about relationships. What's your relationship with yourself, with your food systems, you know, within your community? And we've lost touch with that. I love what you're saying, Um, mostly because I think a lot of people feel powerless when it comes to what they're consuming and, mm-hmm. and um, we almost just willfully accept kind of this, this programming that's, that's put in front of us. Like yeah. we have no agency over how to create the change. Yeah. And so much of it just comes down to you just saying, I'm not going to participate in that yeah. model yeah. and I'm going to, I'm just going to start doing things differently and start creating a consumption model that serves me instead of, you know, brings me down and makes me, you know, a lesser person makes my community uh, less empowered. So, you know, I love that about the beef initiative. I think yeah. it's, there's, there's a lot of teeth to it and there's so much that I think people can take away from this conversation. Um, most of which is the fact that we have the power to create the change. We just need to buy into the right models. Yeah, we do. Once it go, it's perspective. And I tell people is man, it's so simple. It's complicated to most people right now mm-hmm. because we're so inundated with uh, high frequency anxiety and divisiveness and information. Man, I don't do too much consuming at all. As far I don't watch TV, I don't you know I don't listen to news. I I really do silo out this this beautiful mind of mine, and I mean that it's a beautiful mind. And everybody needs to start thinking the same way about themselves, man. There's a form of empowerment out there that's free. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to ask for permission. You know, and quit validating the fucking deceptions. If you keep on continuing validating deceptions, that's lies. What does that say to you about yourself? You know, in the Bitcoin space, I always say, hey, man, what'd you eat today? And they'll say, I said, well, what's the big slogan in Bitcoin, man? Don't trust, verify. Yeah. Okay, did you verify everything that you consume? No. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you can't, right? But if you can go out there and really make a consorted effort to start verifying basically your consumption model and testing it, your life improves overnight. Mm. No matter who you are, maybe you need to do a 48 hour bone broth fast. Maybe you need to fast for seven days. Maybe you need to ease off of highly processed corn syrup, you know, everything out there. It's a drug, man. My dad was a counselor for 30 years. I know what addiction looks like. I know what detox is. I know what mental health is and is not. And this nation is suffering from everything right now. Why? Because what we're consuming. You become what you think. I don't care what you say, man. You become your thoughts. You manifest this stuff. Like we were talking about being in the end zone. Mm -hmm. Never been there. Get in that end zone as an individual. Say, I'm going to change. And quit consuming all these basically people out there that call them nutrition experts. 
you know, I divorce the medical system as much as I can. You know, I've only used it whenever I've broken shit usually, yep. right? But I will not go to, if I go to a doctor right now, I'm going to look at him and say, what do you know about nutrition? And if he has the wrong answer, I ain't going to, first I'm going to tell him to put down his tablet, <laughs> that it's telling him to write me a prescription, and we're going to have a talk. Yes. Yes. And so that's what people can do. Go, go get your blood work done. See where you stand. Then go get some, you know, do a 48 hour bone broth fast that we did after the first summit. Mm. That, I mean, I had story after story people wrote in. You know, I was up in Boston, mass adoption last year, and that happens again in May this year. Cattleman's Feast up there. I had a couple came up to me, gave me a hug, never knew them anything. They weren't going to have a child. They were listening to all the bullshit. They became Bitcoiners. They became basically carnivores. Mm. <laughs> They went in there and they engineered a new lifestyle by starting with a 48-hour bone broth fast. And then their child brought, they were with their child, they brought their little girl there to the Cattleman's Feast. It was her first week on protein. She was eating beef for the first time wow. in her life. And it was as simple as doing a 48-hour bone broth fast. Market access to yourself again. Simple but powerful, right? It's yeah. like we're in this, to your point, it's we're really in this metabolic and moral bankruptcy, mm -hmm. but we are the ultimate agents over our own life. We're empowered by God to be able to take change, be able to change your life, be able to take control. And it's everything that you're talking about. Rip up the playbook, build a new one, find a rancher to connect with, start going to church, take an honest look in the mirror and make out a list of the attributes of the person that you want to become, meditate on that stuff every yeah. single night put in the reps and the iterations and you can look back on a year and you're not even going to recognize who you're going to be because it's going to be so incredible. It is. It's an amazing journey, man. And what, you know, I, I call 2024 the year of truth. Mm. Okay. And I always tell people that don't understand, you know, what Bitcoin did for me and how it helped really, you know, the beef initiative was founded with the ethos of Bitcoin. Yes. Decentralization value, you know, value store value, you know, transparency, Honesty, everything that Bitcoin stands for, a lot of people don't understand. You know, they still think it's like a stock or something. But, you know, I looked at it as a store of value for the cow. But what it is, is it's got an ethos there that's easy to live by. And if you can tap into that mindset first, it's a decentralized mindset. Decentralize your life. Decentralize your thinking. Quit relying on this, this media apparatus that we have, you know, basically lying to us every day mm. that so many people are addicted to. You know, we've got Tucker Carl Carlson now. We've got Elon. We've got so many people saying the same things. Yep. We've been saying it for years now. Now, finally, I'll put them to work. And, you know, hey, Elon, you know, come to the gates of the Beef Initiative. I'm going to have a story about old Elon. He should have a Tesla call uh, – Tesla called uh, – not Mustang. Ford did that. We'll call it. Uh, uh, I'll figure something out. We'll call it Mustang. No, nah, we'll call it uh, the Tesla Maverick. I like that. There's a story, and uh, I'm not going to tell the story today. We'll have to wait. We got to get. Permission. We'll have to do another. We're going to have to do part four. Yes. <laughs> well, well, Slim, we're we're very grateful that there's people like you that exist, and I think that calling you a fearless trailblazer is probably a little bit of an understatement. But you're someone that we've personally learned a lot from. We're just very grateful to be able to have this conversation with you, be friends with you, have learned from you, and um, just really excited as we enter into 2024, the year of truth, what we all go on to do. So yeah. thank you. And Brett, thank you. Uh, Harry, thank you. I know that everybody out there is wanting me to say a lot today as far as different touch points, but just hear me out on this one. Three NDAs. You're about to see some powerful things happen through the gates of the Beef Initiative. And... Everybody, after you see this podcast, what you can do is share the podcast. Yep. Get me, you two, get me on more podcasts. I'm not going to be silent anymore. <laughs> and uh, this is just kind of, uh, this was just preseason. This is the oh, start yeah. of the storm, yeah. baby. We're Here just we seasoning go. the steak right now. Yeah, we've got. Even put it on the grill. Exactly. This is going to get fun, folks. I love you it. You know, come see us in July. We're going to, uh, we can tell everybody right now, right? Y'all Oh go yeah. in? Little Tom. Yeah, we're in. Yeah. All right, guys. Instead of, uh, you know, they had that hot dog eating contest is that at long island Joey coney Chestnut, island yeah coney island coney, coney island, island. yeah but we're gonna have all right everybody leave their weenies at at the door <laughs> we're gonna have the world's first tomahawk ribeye eating contest we're gonna have 21 contestants you 
to me, everybody in the Beef Initiative, or we're going to recruit the best 21 contestants, carnivore influencers. You said Sean Baker. Let's get Sean. Yep, we're going we to get the biggest steak Sean. eaters. We're going to yes. go at it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to franchise this out. Once a year, we're going to have the world's famous tomahawk ribeye eating contest. we got to get Jason Rick on there. Of course. He's got to be eating. But he might have to get like an extra few seconds with uh, the th- no thumb. Yeah, he does. Oh, yeah. We'll give him I a little have extra a, yeah. handicap or something. He doesn't have a thumb. I ain't got a finger. Okay. Yeah, and but you're right. We'll have to give him a handicap. <laughs> Don't tell him that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll get butt hurt. But you know, let's look at uh, let's look at Rick Ranches, everybody. Look it up, Jason Rick Rick Ranches. He's got a new Airbnb that he's uh, you know, doing. He's got a new storefront. Look up Panhandle Meats. Look up Hometown Meats. Look at, you know, K&C Cattle. Look at... Holy uh, Cow Beef. Holy Cow Beef. Look at Shirt Tail Creek. Oh, you can look at all of those through the Beef Initiative. Yep. They're all in the index. 200 plus, all yes. trusted, verified. This is not just like scraping scraping data and throwing it in. These are no. all people that you've, you and the team have personally met and trusted and verified. This is it, 100%. And we're not going to play by those rules anymore. We're not going to play by the rules of what got us here. Mm. Yep. We, we're playing by our own rules, and that's basically following the law better than a lot of the law enforcers basically follow the law. So that's what's going to be exciting about this. This is, I said it in the very freaking first podcast. I said, this is an international lifestyle you just don't understand yet. Yeah. Well, you can understand it now because now we have a global mapping system that we're going to release too. And you're going to be able to find producers and places to stay all over the United States and the world right now. I went to Australia, went to Asia. We're going to be doing something in Thailand. There's a beef initiative in Thailand now. This stuff is about to transpire into basically something that we're reinventing everything that is commodity based we've got the program now Mm. so we are the vertical integration that all these associations talk about cattlemen's associations from ncba to u.s cattlemen's association to rcaf a lot of them do a lot of great work i'm not a loyalist yeah i'm going to say what i'm going to say But I want to work with every one of these associations because they're going to be adopting our policies Mm. moving forward. I love it. We'll buckle up, baby. Here we go. Yeehaw. We appreciate it, brother. Thank Thank you you. as always. You too, guys. Thanks, Lynn. Yep. We'll talk to you soon.